good morning. Uh, now, today's topic is Weber's uh, theory of legal rational authority and his theory of uh, bureaucracy. Uh, uh, this is one of those uh, questions, uh, those topics Weber is probably the, the best known for. Uh, it's also a rather complicated issue. When we are saying uh, legal rational authority, we briefly refer to the rule, rule of law, and we tend to associate in our mind the rule of law uh, with liberal market economies and liberal democracies. Well, Weber has a very complex argument about this. Um, uh, indeed, legal rational authority is the kind of system of authority which is predictable uh, because there is an observable law everybody is uh, uh, subordinated to, which uh, in fact has the uh, most uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the clearest elective affinity with a market economy. Um, nevertheless, uh, um, uh, as we will see, he will argue that, uh, which is very uh, counterintuitive, that the purest type of legal rational authority is bureaucracy. And this is usually what uh, we don't have in our mind when we are uh, thinking about uh, uh, a market economy, that it is bureaucratic. So um, uh, we have to deal with Weber's interesting claim that the purest type of legal rational authority, which goes together with a market capitalist economy, is actually bureaucracy. Um, it's also interesting that Weber does not make an assumption that uh, a bureaucracy, legal rational authority, or capitalism necessarily goes together with democracy. How democracy fits into the picture is uh, rather problematic for him. Of course, we have to appreciate that in Weber's, when Weber was writing um, uh, about these issues somewhere between uh, 1914 and 1920, uh, uh, I mean virtually none of the countries in the world were liberal democracies on universal suffrage. Um, uh, the political systems of the world changed so much in the last hundred years. But he problematizes this relationship, and it's actually quite useful. So this is a, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, guideline for today's lecture. Again, I start with uh, uh, the definition of the ideal type, the purest type of legal rational authority, and then I try to dig into this uh, unusual but very influential Weberian argument that bureaucracy, in fact, is the purest type of legal rational authority. And then I will look at various kind of uh, limitations uh, of the exercise of bureaucratic authority. One is collegiality. The other is functional division of labor, right? The separation of various branches of government, which is a limitation on bureaucracy and representation, democracy as a limitation on government. So you can see that he sees um, a tension right, between democracy, bureaucracy, legal rational authority, and capitalism. They do not go as easily together as usually we Americans tend to think about this. And then uh, a couple of ideas about uh, uh, his, uh, his view about uh, 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 democracies. Okay, so let me start with uh, what is the pure type um, of uh, uh, legal rational authority. And uh, there are really two issues we have to very briefly talk about. Um, there are different ways how laws and norms can be established. We're already beginning to feel our way into the problem whether the rule of law and democracy are identical, or, you know, it can be democratic or does not have to be that democ dem democratic. Um, and uh, uh, then the question is uh, who obeys uh, what uh, and whom under legal authority? Um, so, um, uh, and uh, a bit about uh, legal rational authority. So there, uh, the argument is, right, that there are various ways um, how uh, uh, laws uh, or norms can be established. Uh, 
Um, uh, and uh, well, he said, you know, uh, legal authority rests on the acceptance of the following ideas, right? Well, uh, the norms, he said, can be established by agreement. That's what we usually think when we think about um, rule of law, or by imposition. It can be imposed uh, on people, right? And it can happen on the ground of expediency. It can happen because these are the most useful laws, and therefore we either agree that this is what we want to obey, or there is an authority which will impose on us. Or it can be based on value rationality. May not be that expedient, may not be necessarily immediately useful, but on the basis of shared values or the values of those who impose those laws, um, and we tend to believe it, uh, 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 we will, uh, 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 this is the way how it will be established. And then, you know, of course, the legal system um, has to be uh, somewhat consistent, uh, uh, right? Uh, this is important for the predictability of the system and has to be intentionally established, right? It's not coming uh, uh, from uh, uh, um, accident, but intentionally established. But the major point what I wanted to make, right, that uh, legal rational authority uh, in Weber's view um, can be actually an authoritarian system. Uh, uh, let's say um, uh, uh, Chile under Pinochet, the later times after he established, consolidated his power. Earlier on, it was a tyrannical rule, but later on, you know, Pinochet established uh, a legal rational order, though it was not democratic at all. Right? It was operating uh, with legal system, which was imposed uh, on people. And you know, in history, we have. Uh, uh, a number of instances when we can say, you know, this country is a, a you know, country of uh, um, law and, and law and order. Uh, we know what the laws are. Uh, we actually think the laws are not unreasonable, but it was imposed by some power upon us. Now, the next question is, uh, who obeys uh, whom? And, well, I don't want to dwell on this along. This is quite clear. You already are familiar with this, what is important, right, the person who is on, in, in authority, who issues orders, uh, um, 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 is himself uh, subject to an impersonal order. So we are all subject to the same order. This is the essence of legal rational authority. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, at least in the idea of type, right? Uh, we, we know uh, the exceptions to this. Uh, uh, we know that Berlusconi, for instance, in Italy, though Italy is really a legal rational authority, for a long time managed uh, right, uh, to pass a legislation uh, which um, enabled him to escape prosecution, though he's probably involved a number of criminal activities, but somehow he managed to escape criminal prosecution. Uh, but that's the exception. The rule is Right, that even the person who is uh, uh, highest in charge is subject to the same authority and has to obey the law. Uh, and this is again very obvious. We already covered this, uh, the opposite, the mirror image of it, right? Uh, the members of the society uh, over obedience uh, uh, not to the superior, not as an individual, but to an impersonal order. To, to the law as such. That should be quite obvious. Now, um, uh, so what are the major characteristics of a system which is based on legal rational order? There is a continuous rule-bound conduct. Uh, it's again, you know, I think does not uh, call for too much uh, uh, clarification. Uh, it is continuously the same rules. The rules uh, ch change slowly and with a great deal of difficulties. As we can see, how Congress is struggling to pass a law about health care reform. You know, it takes months or years before an important le new piece of legislation gets into uh, place. And usually new pieces of legislation 
uh, in legal rational authority are grandfathered, right? If you pass a new law, you change the rules of the game, you usually grandfather them. Those who enter the game before the new law are still under the rule of the old law. We do that at the universities all the time, right? If, for instance, the degree requirements do change in a university, almost always these degree requirements are, uh, this, uh, this new legislation is grandfathered, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the terminology, right? It will not apply to people who are already in the program. It will only apply to people who are entering the program or, at, uh, or you know, one way of grandfathering it that we give people a choice, you know? If you want to operate under the new rule, you can opt for the new rule, uh, or if you want to stay under uh, the old rule, you can stay on the old rule. Uh, only do, for do, those are the new rule binding who are entering the system now. So that's very important, right? That is continuous and, uh, and, uh, uh, and rule bound. And he's also said in legal rational authority, uh, there must be a very clear separation of spheres uh, of competence, right? Uh, who is uh, uh, competent to carry out what? Uh, and then you can always uh, uh, figure out how you navigate in a legal rational order. You will be told, well, this is not my table. Uh, you go somewhere else. So you go and you ask something um, from uh, the director of uh, undergraduate studies, and the director of undergraduate studies might say, go and see uh, the dean of your residential college, right? Because that is the sphere of competence of the residential college. That's the way how legal rational order is supposed to operate. And the same, you know, occasionally the dean of college will say, well, you have to see um, uh, your sociology professor or your economics professor, right? You want to get transfer credit, uh, for instance, for a summer course. And then the dean of college, they all said, you know, it is the department, be political science or economics or uh, anthropology, they will be able to tell whether this is, can be accepted as uh, 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 an economics course at Yale, right? Um, um, and this also implies that there is always a hierarchy and the right to have appeal. This is, again, you are very familiar with. You know exactly uh, if uh, uh, you, uh, you get a grade from your discussion section leader, you can appeal to the, to the professor to say, well, I don't think it's a fair enough grade. I deserve a better grade. You know, uh, my section leader made an, an error. And if you are uh, in unhappy with the response of the professor, you go to the chair of the department and appeal to the chair. And there is a whole hierarchy of appeal, right? Where you can try to correct uh, what you think uh, is uh, 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 not right. So I think it's extremely important that you know, you, you know exactly what is the chain of appeal and how far you can go up. Usually uh, there is also some uh, specialized training uh, which is uh, uh, expected for people to, to occupy certain positions. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, well, uh, uh, discussion section leaders will always be um, at least graduate students. Uh, um, uh, 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 usually, uh, well, uh, people can teach their own course once they were uh, uh, past, uh, um, uh, uh, they are uh, PhD students, but uh, all what they have is a dissertation to finish, or they must have their PhD, right? So there is a um, specialized training necessary uh, to perform certain functions uh, as such. Uh, um, and that's a, uh, an interesting and very complex idea, right, that the staff has to be separated from the ownership of means of production and administration. This is even um, uh, more important for, uh, for, for Weber's argument. Uh, being separated, you know, it's uh, not, not that easy to penetrate what he exactly wants to say with this. What, what does it mean that you do not own the means of administration? It basically means that the source of rules and laws are outside of the administrator as such. If you want to have any change in the rules, there must be some procedure which is beyond the person who is administering that rules, how the rules can be changed, right? Um, this in order, you, you have to prevent uh, 
um, uh, unpredictability in the system. And that's uh, why, you know, rules change all the time. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the fundamental principle is that these rules should not be allowed to be changed uh, um, by uh, the person um, who um, administers uh, right, uh, th those rules. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, you know, just to give a very trivial example, uh, once uh, you got your syllabus and the course requirement and, uh, you know, what kind of um, assignments you have to uh, uh, deliver during uh, the, the, the course in order to get credit in this course. Then, uh, well, do, working out these rules, a uh, uh, professor plays a role. Uh, but, you know, we have to be, get approved by the courses and curriculum committee. And then, in a way, we are bound by those rules. So, on the way, I could not announce you today, well, I changed my mind and there will be uh, an unseen, you know, final examination where you will, have, uh, you, you, you will have to get a final examination, right? And you will not know what questions I will ask and I can ask any question for the whole course, right? If I would change right, these, uh, these rules right now, uh, you would have, I'm sure, appeal, you know, against me, against my decision, right? I'm bound by rules. So that, that means that I don't own the means of administration, right? I am, I am administering, right, uh, what is uh, in, in, in the syllabus. Well, there is a little leeway, right? Occasionally I can give you an extension, for instance, uh, uh, if you come to me. I mean, therefore, it's a, uh, you know, there is a little flexibility in the system. But fundamentally, you know, the course should be taught as, as it is uh, uh, in the syllabus and the requirement should be like it is in, in the syllabus. That's what, what it means, right? That you do not own, right, the means of administration. Unlike um, in traditional authority, where a feudal lord uh, does have, uh, does own, uh, appropriated some means of administration from uh, uh, the, the monarch. Uh, and, uh, you know, a, a British or a French uh, high aristocracy uh, could make rules. Uh, um, um, uh, not uh, implemented the rules, but could make rules as well. The unique feature of modern uh, uh, legal rational authority is that this becomes an impersonal process, uh, by which is um, uh, 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 not done. There is a separation between those who implement the rules, and there is a separate procedure, right, how the rules are being established. Is that reasonably clear? What? ownership of means of administration means. As I pointed out, it's a very Weberian idea, right? For, for Marx, right, the whole issue is the means of, uh, uh, ownership of means of production. For Weber, this is everything about uh, the administrations, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the means of administration. Okay, now we come to this very interesting Weberian theory of the bureaucracy. Very interesting, very controversial, in many ways very counterintuitive. Uh, you may say it is false. Uh, uh, well, uh, <laughs> we will see. Uh, that, that is a nice topic for discussion sections. Um, and uh, we, I will, this is what I will go through. A number of issues. What is a bureaucracy? Uh, Weber makes this... Uh, uh, a quite incredible claim, but first uh, you will completely reject that the most efficient organization is the bureaucracy, right? That's exactly the opposite of what you, you think. You know, when, when something is very inefficient, then you say, well, this is so bureaucratic, right? Weber nevertheless claims that the most efficient organization is bureaucracy. Then, uh, you know, the question is, how is bureaucracy related to capitalism and socialism? Is really capitalism a bureaucratic organization? What is the relationship between capitalist market economy and bureaucracy? What are the consequences of bureaucracy? And also then some contradiction of bureaucratization. Now, let's just quickly rush through uh, what are the characteristics uh, um, of a bureaucracy. Well, he said, uh, the purest type of legal authority, this is, as I said, counterintuitive, is that one which employs a bureaucratic administrative staff. And, uh, well, uh, what are 
the, the characteristics of this staff in order to qualify to, be, to, to bureaucracy. Well, they have to be personally free, so it cannot be clients, right, uh, of a mentor, right? Uh, they are uh, legally free individuals. That makes it so different, right, from a traditional organization. That's why a family is not a bureaucratic organization, because you are not uh, 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 there by choice, right? Um, uh, and then a bureaucracy is organized into a hierarchy of offices. This is something which basically we already covered. Um, and uh, the offices are uh, filled uh, by a, a free contract. Um, and uh, in this contract, uh, uh, what your qualification is, that's what we call right, meritocracy. People do have a certain degree, and that degree qualifies them to be incumbents of a certain office. And they receive a fixed salary. That's, uh, 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 it's not quite a bureaucratic organization um, if you are working for a commission, right? Uh, you are really in a bureaucratic organization when you sign uh, a contract and you know exactly what your fringe benefits will be and what your annual salary will, will be. Uh, uh, typically, the office is, uh, is the sole occupation of the incumbents and it constitutes a career. This is also very important, again, very different. Uh, from a traditional organization where people uh, could uh, uh, actually be, be incumbents uh, of a number of positions and could draw, in fact, even incomes from a number of positions. In a pure bureaucratic organization, uh, you really can have only um, uh, a single occupation. Um, uh, uh, you know, if, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, somebody is appointed uh, uh, with tenure to Yale um, and uh, is coming from another institution, will have to resign from his or her tenure at the other institution. Uh, if you are employed by Yale, you can be only a Yale employee. You cannot hold multiple jobs at the same time. Uh, um, uh, and it constitutes a career. Uh, the career means there is a ladder. You have some sense, you know, how you will progress in this bureaucratic hierarchy. Uh, again, the un universities are classical bureaucracies. You know that you entered as an assistant professor, uh, then you are seven to nine years, depending on the institution, uh, without tenure, then you are being promoted to tenure, then you expect at one point of time to become a full professor, blah, blah, blah. Right? Th this is what it meant, it is a career. And in many bureaucratic organizations, even in the business world, right, you have a sense, you know, how you progress. Uh, in a law firm, right, uh, if you enter a law firm, right, uh, you, ha you have a pretty clear idea that it's actually very similar to the universities. Usually for seven years you are working for the law firm, and that's when you be uh, be can become, right, a partner in the law firm, right? And um, the, the, you know, so you, 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 you have a sense how your career will unfold. Um, uh, well, uh, this is uh, something we already kind of uh, um, uh, 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 covered, right, that you, you are separated from the means of administration uh, uh, because you are subjected to discipline and control. Now comes the very controversial idea, and what uh, we, we have to talk about it. Uh, Weber's claim, uh, you know, which is uh, against, uh, very much against common sense, uh, um, that uh, uh, the purely bureaucratic type of administration is capable of attaining the highest degree of efficiency. Uh, uh, well, let me, on the other hand, from this citation, underline uh, an important point here. And th th this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, of course, Weber was talking about a very specific type of organization, you know, bureaucracies, uh, which are were, relatively speaking, historically quite efficient, like the, the Prussian type of bureaucracy. But here, here he emphasizes, and this is, uh, these are two very important words 
from the technical point of view, right? The bureaucracy from the technical point of view is the most efficient organization. It does not necessarily mean that it does achieve the highest welfare for people who are seeking to navigate in a bureaucratic organization. But technically speaking, it is the most efficient. Why? Because it has a very high degree of predictability. I mean, this predictability might suggest that it will take you a long time to get through of that bloody red tape, right? What the bureaucracy imposes on you. But you know exactly the red tape, and you know if you are stuck, you know how to try to appeal and to get the process moving. So, and therefore, the crucial issue, he said, why the bureaucracy is so efficient, because it is technically competent, uh, and it is, it is predictable. And uh, this is what makes it uh, actually uh, uh, so cl uh, to fit so well with a, 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 a market. Uh, uh, well, he, he said, and what else? If, if it is not bureaucracy, how can you otherwise organize an organization? If it is not done bureaucratically, then it is dilettantism, right? Uh, um, uh, and you may want to think about this. Now, uh, uh, here comes the question about uh, how does uh, bureaucracy and capitalism uh, fit, fits into? Um, uh, and now he makes a very intriguing, very provocative claim. Uh, I think it is very deep uh, and deserves your attention. He said, the primary source of superiority in a bureaucratic administration uh, lies in technical knowledge, uh, right? Uh, bureaucracy is domination through knowledge. Well, uh, a, a very provocative, very important claim, right? Bureaucracy is, right, the par excellence meritocratic organization, right? that people who are issuing command are issuing command with the assumptions that they are the most competent people to carry this out. Well, whether this is the case or not, I, you know, you remember, Weber is always operating with ideal types or pure types. The concrete cases may be uh, different from it. Uh, you may have people who are not competent uh, to exercise uh, uh, the authority, what they do exercise. But I think it is important that you have the idea of type because then you can be upset and you say, this bloody bastard, right? It is incompetent, cannot do the job. And then you can appeal and to say, why don't you remove this person? Because this person does not know what his or her job is. And actually, such appeal very often is consequential. People, occasionally, I remove that position if their incompetence is being demonstrated. Um, well, this is very difficult to do at a university, because universities, we have this system of tenure, you know. Uh, after you suffered for seven years as an assistant professor, you are promoted to tenure, and then it is very difficult to get you out of the job. But even at the university, it is possible. If you find out that I'm completely incompetent, right, you document that I am incompetent, right? That I'm just misinterpreting all the authors you had here. Um, and then you can appeal, right, to the university. And you can say that I really should be removed. I, you know, my uh, tenure should be invoked. And if I found to be incompetent, I will lose my job. Uh, but the only way to do it, yeah, to prove my in incompetence. Uh, actually, universities very rarely do it because it's a very painful exercise. But because they are bureaucracies, there is, right, the rule that it can happen and it should happen in these cases. And then he said, well, from this point of view, it really does not matter whether an economy is organized as uh, um, a capitalistic economy based on private ownership, or whether it is organized as a socialist economy based on public ownership, right? And in fact, now he goes even further. And it's very interesting what he's, he got to say here. In, um, uh, he's writing this somewhere in 1919, 1920, 
Uh, the Soviet Union already exists. Soviet Russia already exists. There is already a society which calls itself socialist, which eliminated private ownership. And he said, well, socialism would require a still higher degree of formal bureaucratization than capitalism. That's a very interesting idea. Though until now he suggested, right, that uh, uh, the bureaucratic organization fits the best with free market economy. Now he said, actually socialism will be even more bureaucratic. And then I think what comes very, it's a very intriguing idea. And he said, but the big problem with socialism is that there will be a big conflict here between uh, the formal rationality and substantive rationality, what the bureaucracy carries out. And you know by now, right, uh, or you have at least a hunch, what he's getting at between formal and substantive rationality. Right? Formal rationality is that you are simply implementing the rules of the game. Um, uh, substantive rationality is you are actually concerned with the welfare, the substantive goals of the action. And he said, well, if you have a publicly owned economy, centrally planned economy, then the central planners make substantive decisions about the economy. They decide, for instance, where government or taxpayer money should go, uh, go to, you know, which branches of the economy should be investment going to, right? In a capitalist economy, governments you typically cannot do that, right? They set the rules of the game. Well, the best, you know, they manage interest rates and, you know, they may be able to manage the currency exchange rate, but they cannot allocate resources across the economy. Or if they do, uh, then people will say we are on the road to socialism, right? To the extent substantive rationality is involved. But he said, well, if it is socialism, there will be this big tension, right? You cannot be at the same time formally rational and substantively rational. You either uh, consider the content of your decisions or you are concerned simply with the procedures of the decision. If you are concerned with the procedure, that is formal rationality. If you are concerned with the content, that is substantive rationality. Let me just give you one example about the legal system. Uh, indeed, in communist societies, uh, uh, and probably to some extent even China today, uh, uh, to much less so than it was, let's say, 30 or 40 years ago, uh, well, uh, when justice is being served by the court, uh, the court is not blind uh, to who the people who are being accused of committing some crime is. Uh, um, uh, uh, the communist legal system called itself a class law. That, in fact, the purpose of the legal system is not to be blind, right, uh, who committed the crime, the purpose of the legal system is, that was the kind of legitimacy claim under communism, to defend the interest of the working class, um, right? And therefore, um, that was uh, specifically a legal system based on substantive rationality, right? Well, uh, um, uh, capitalist legal system tend to be procedurally, right? rationalistic, formally rationalistic. In principle, it doesn't matter who the person is when you are serving uh, justice. This is again the ideal, right? Uh, in concrete cases, actually, um, uh, uh, judges might consider some sub substantive characteristics of the person who is on trial, not simply to implement the law, uh, may consider as mitigating circumstances, right? For instance, when they are passing the law. And of course, there are other reasons how actually substantive considerations enter the game, you know? Um, if you are white and rich, uh, you can hire a better defense lawyer and your ch chances to get off the hook uh, within the same rules are better. So substantive considerations enter the scene. But that's the exception. That's not supposed to happen. We are angry when it, this is happens, right? We want to have 
a faceless legal system, right? Uh, justice is blind, right? This blindness of justice means, right, this is simply procedurally just, right? And not substantively so, right? This is why justice is shown with blind eyes. Now, what are the consequences of bureaucratization? Uh, here are some of them. He said there is a tendency of leveling of interest. Since everybody is in principle equal uh, before the law, um, and therefore interest will be leveled, you, you, you are not supposed to take into account people's position in it. Uh, um, well, <coughs> there is a tendency, meritocratic tendency, that people uh, higher up will have higher levels of training or more training as such. Uh, and uh, th this is again, you know, justice is blind. Uh, uh, what is Im uh, important is uh, uh, that uh, the essence of uh, a bureaucracy has to be uh, a formalistic impersonality. Sine uh, ira et studio, uh, without hatred and passion, right? Uh, this is why occasionally you are kind of upset when you are confronted with the bureaucracy. You have a special problem, you know, and then the bureaucracy tends to be insensitive to your special problem, right? Uh, 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 when it is a real bureaucracy, right? Uh, you can say, you know, I just uh, uh, had a, a fight uh, with my uh, uh, partner and this is why I cannot take the test. Well, see, you know, at studio, I mean, uh, in a real bureaucratic uh, discussion leader or professor will say, too bad, uh, you know, this is your personal business, the test is right now, <laughs> right? Uh, you take it or leave it. Well, I mean, uh, we are usually not that uh, stupid bureaucrats, but that's the spirit of bureaucracy, right? Uh, without hatred and passion, that also means that you are not motivated by um, uh, uh, personal uh, 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 feelings. You know, you don't differentiate. This is a person I like, and then I give preferences or dislike, and therefore give a, a, a worse grade. All right, there are a number of contradictions of bureaucracy. Uh, uh, it is a, 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 a very formalistic. Uh, um, and he said there is also another interesting tendency, though it is formalistic and it's supposed to go uh, by uh, the, uh, uh, simply by the rule, uh, rules, occasionally not only under socialism, in all systems the bureaucracy tend to have uh, uh, some sensitivity to substantive rationality, to the welfare of the people who are under uh, the bureaucracy, and then it can turn into a clientelistic system. The, bu the bureaucracy can can have these uh, uh, these tendency and think about welfare bureaucracies, right? Which do have a great deal of clientelistic tendencies built into them. Well, and there are these various limitations of bureaucratic authority. One is collegiality, a division of powers, and representation. Well, um, I don't want to dwell too long on the notion of collegiality. Collegiality, he says, really grows out of uh, 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 what we knew as as professional or groups or professional or organizations. Uh, um, uh, there are different ways how collegiality uh, can, can operate. Uh, one way, uh, uh, that, that means that you are interacting with other people in the same uh, organization on the basis of collegiality. Uh, you can uh, get a good sense of this collegial collegiality, for instance, uh, uh, it's very important in the medical profession. Um, if you go to a doctor for a second opinion, uh, this doctor is really not supposed to say that his or her colleague, the other doctor, 
uh, uh, really screwed it and he, he gave you the wrong diagnosis or, or, the, uh, or the wrong therapy, right? Uh, collegiality means that you stick together, right? That the profession uh, sticks together. Um, uh, there is a very strong sense of collegiality among lawyers, or at least supposed to be. The ethic of legal profession is very much collegiality, and it is also uh, 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 incidentally in, in, in the universities. I mean, uh, faculty is not supposed to badmouth each other, right? They uh, uh, certainly towards students, they have to show that they have a collegial relationship with each other. Mutual respect binds them together. Uh, occasionally there is uh, what he calls veto collegiality. The collegiality does, uh, does give veto right to certain people to, to run this organization. A single person can veto um, uh, a decision uh, as such. Uh, again, very typical in universities. Uh, um, uh, when it comes, for instance, to decision whether somebody will be granted a permanent position in a university, so-called tenure, that is actually um, the president of the university usually has a veto right and can veto, no matter that all uh, bodies uh, um, approve that, the president usually have a veto right, can veto that decision. It uses it very rarely, uh, but occasionally it does use uh, um, its veto right. Uh, so I, in, 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 even in a collegially organized uh, 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 bureaucracy, there is this uh, 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 individual veto right. Otherwise, collegiality usually operates through def different committees and advisory boards. Uh, 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 I mean, collegiality usually is emerging in a situation where uh, you have a common trade or a common profession. That's when uh, a group is being organized uh, as a collegial bureaucracy um, as such. Uh, um, and uh, 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 many of you will end up uh, in professions uh, in which uh, uh, you will have uh, 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 such a collegial um, uh, 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 environment as such. Uh, um, uh, okay, uh, the other issue is, which is also a limitation of uh, the functioning of the bureaucracy, right? A collegiality meant, right, that though uh, the uh, bureaucracy is supposed to be um, blind to individual differences, it's not always because we have loyalties towards each other based on our profession. Lawyers are legal to lawyers and doctors are loyal to fellow doctors and professors are have a degree of loyalty. Um, now the other one is uh, um, uh, uh, the division of, uh, uh, of powers. Uh, um, uh, well, this division of powers, uh, uh, what Locke uh, and Montesquieu and Rousseau were talking about, uh, well, it's uh, a, a functional system uh, he cites Montesquieu about the separation of power. Um, uh, 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 <coughs> uh, and uh, 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 that uh, creates some degree of uh, uh, unpredictability uh, in, in, in the system, but necessary, but creates some degree um, of uh, unpredictability. Nevertheless, uh, this is the way how to prevent tyranny, so therefore it is good for the economy, by what he means, for the market economy. And then comes the question of representations uh, and different forms of uh, uh, representations. Uh, uh, well, <coughs> there are very, again, you know, representation can be democratic, and, and, but is not necessarily all that bloody democratic. Uh, 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 in fact, there is a possibility of representation when the representation is uh, happening through some hereditary means. Uh, uh, US, you know, uh, in uh, uh, traditional authority, uh, people who were born in certain position, like Montesquieu himself, uh, was supposed to represent certain interest. Uh, um, uh, which is beyond uh, the personal interest of the, the, the person, right, was supposed to represent uh, uh, 
uh, the interest of the whole estate, uh, what it, it was standing for. Uh, well, it's also uh, in modern times we do have a representation where, where representations can be selected by, by rotation or, or lot. Um, uh, in ancient Greece this happened. Um, uh, and there can be a limited uh, 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 mandate. Um, uh, they are not representing uh, 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 necessarily the interest uh, of the constituency. And they can be uh, can, can be recalled. Uh, um, uh, this is, was typical of uh, communist bureaucracies. Uh, or there can be what he calls free representation, is what we would associate to democracy, where the representative is elected rather than uh, selected or appointed. Um, and uh, but it is also not bound by instructions; uh, is only obliged to express uh, his own. Uh, uh, conviction. Uh, so uh, this is what we have seen in the Congress uh, happening, right? That Demo Democrats uh, um, uh, voted with uh, uh, Republicans because those Democrats argued, "I'm not under party discipline, right? I am acting out of my conscience." Um, well, uh, 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 a couple of ideas about uh, free representation and how it goes with. A capitalist economy. Well, uh, what is crucial, right, and Weber keeps coming back and back to this, what is vital for a capitalist economy is to be a calculability and reliability. Um, uh, uh, um, and uh, uh, well, in uh, early stages, uh, in fact, there was property qualification who could actually vote. And that was uh, implemented in order to make uh, the system more predictable for the property classes. There was a great deal of concern by the bourgeoisie to give universal suffrage because they felt then this will be unpredictable, who will um, win the elections. Uh, um, in fact, uh, very often these were monarchs and absolutist monarchs who were pushing for extension right, uh, of suffrage because they wanted to use this against the property uh, bourgeoisie. That's, uh, again, something very counterintuitive, but I think uh, historically a very accurate uh, 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 understanding, right? So one has to be very careful uh, what exactly the relationship with a capitalist economic order and democracy is. Uh, uh, so Weber's fundamental argument is what many people who do the history of democratic movement will agree, others will disagree with him. Again, a good subject for discussion. Um, uh, parliamentary free representation was the product uh, between uh, struggles, actual struggles between monarchs and the bourgeoisie. Uh, uh, well, I think I just leave this. Uh, here uh, probably gave us enough uh, food for the discussion. Thank you.